Last week, then, we started out on a new series through the letter of James. And if you cast your mind back, you'll hopefully remember that as believers, we can know that even in our hardest circumstances and times of trial, that fruit can be produced in our hearts, that we can know fruit from the fire. And in doing so, we look together at the first four verses of chapter 1. Well, tonight we move on and we shall be considering verses 5 through 8. And our theme this evening, as we look at these verses, is what to do when you don't know what to do. What to do when you don't know what to do. I wonder, have you ever come to a point... Uh, in your life when you're faced with a situation before you and you have just had to say to yourself, you know what, I just don't know what to do. I have no clue what to do in this situation. I don't know how to proceed. There just there doesn't seem any way forward. Or maybe you feel that there's no right answer and as they say, you're between a rock and a hard place and your mind has just exhausted every avenue you can think of, and you're at the end of yourself. Well, the more I hear of current world affairs, the more I realize that mankind refuses to admit, but clearly displays by their words and their actions that they're just at a loss as to what to do. One thing not to do is to consult Google. If you, if you put that question into Google, what to do when you don't know what to do, here are some of the suggestions that we get back. Take care of yourself. Do something that makes you feel good. Be true to yourself. Just embrace the discomfort. Sleep on it. Take a chance. Just go with the flow. Well, clearly none of those suggestions provide any helpful advice or comfort to a troubled mind in a difficult situation. All of them look inwardly to our own resources. And they have this fatalistic kind of case, sera, sera, whatever will be, will be mentality. For the believer, Scripture has a clear response to this question of what to do when we don't know what to do. And with this in mind, we're going to turn then to verse 5 of chapter 1. I have four points that we'll consider tonight. They are a familiar need, a faithful response, the full provision, and the faithless declined. A familiar need, a faithful response, the full provision, and the faithless declined. So firstly then, a familiar need. Trials have an uncanny way of clouding our understanding and judgment as believers. Through grief and through pain, that comes through time of affliction, through confusion and disappointments that we experience, through, through hurtful experiences, and at times of loss, our minds can become foggy and our spiritual discernment is too easily impaired. I read a good illustration. A man wrote, when I was in the Coast Guard, sometimes the skipper would ask me to steer the boat. He would tell me, the compass course. My job was to keep the boat on that course. The winds and currents would cause the boat to drift, but I had to keep steering it back to the designated course. And eventually we would come in sight of the harbour. One day we had to go out in a terrible storm to rescue a man and his daughter, whose sailboat had become disabled. On that occasion, the skipper didn't ask me to steer the boat, but gave the task to a more experienced man. It's relatively easy to steer the boat in calm seas, but it's an altogether different matter to steer it in 60 mile an hour winds and 30 foot waves. Well, this pictures, I believe, what James is referring to here. It is this concept that James acknowledges in verse 5, cha sorry, chapter 5, verse 1, verse 5 of chapter 1, which we've just read. And he declares, doesn't he, at the start of that verse, if any of you lacks wisdom. This verse links in contrast to, to verse 4, which is prior to it. 
And we read there of the perfect and complete man who lacks nothing. We're not yet perfect. And as such, we know that lack of wisdom James goes on to discuss. And how gracious James is in his first word of that verse, if. The reality, of course, is that we all require wisdom. James could easily have said, since you all lack wisdom. But knowing the persecution his readers are going through, he lovingly puts that suggestion there, if any of you lack wisdom. This word lack, or lapo in the Greek, means to fall short or in need of. This too is gracious. As believers, we have varying degrees of discernment and spiritual wisdom, depending where we are in our spiritual maturity and walk with the Lord. We're not completely devoid of wisdom in Christ, but we can all relate to a lack of wisdom. Even Solomon, the wisest man who lived, save the Lord Jesus, he knew the need for more wisdom. And because of this, we can all relate to the experience as believers of saying, Lord, I just don't know what to do. Sometimes we take our eyes from the Lord and we look to ourselves or to the circumstances we find ourselves in, just as Peter did when he walked on the sea to Jesus. And and what happened? What happens to us? We too sink like Peter did. So what is the wisdom here that that James is referring to? The wisdom that we all have a familiar need of in times of trial. Well, first, let's consider what it's not. James is not referring here to worldly wisdom or earthly wisdom. If we look in chapter 3 and verses 14 to 16, we read, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. It's the type of wisdom we see all around us. Worldly wisdom focused on self, envying those around them. And it results in confusion and all manner of evil. No, the, the root word we have here in this verse... For wisdom is Sophia. It means the ability to judge correctly and to follow the best course of action. Based on knowledge and understanding. We're talking here of spiritual wisdom, not worldly wisdom. James compares worldly wisdom with the wisdom from above in the next verse there in chapter 3, verse 17. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. The very opposite of what we will go on to look in the next few verses in in chapter 1. Spiritual wisdom involves living life in the light of Scripture, taking God's Word and applying it to every area of our life, whether in joyful times or seasons of trial. Vance Havner wrote, if you lack knowledge, go to school. If you lack wisdom, get on your knees. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom is the proper use of knowledge. And the true and genuine believer has received a measure of spiritual wisdom, and we are called to grow in wisdom, just as the Lord did. We read there in Luke 2, 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and men. And if we're to follow in the Lord's footsteps, then this verse should be all of our testimonies as believers. We are to be increasing in wisdom, spiritual stature, and growing in favor with God and those around us. James later writes in his letter, Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. If we display to our church family, to our physical families, and to all that we meet, a a behavior filled with the gentleness of wisdom, we will increase in spiritual stature and honor God in our lives. 
Ultimately, all wisdom is from God. Daniel acknowledged that. In, we read that in Daniel 2, verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So, as we see then, wisdom is not knowledge. We may not know what to do, but spiritual wisdom sends us on our knees to the one who does and is able to give us understanding. And we see, as we move on through, through these verses, then a faithful response. We have acknowledged that we all have that familiar need, the need for wisdom. But how do we respond Just knowing that a doctor can help is of no benefit unless we go to the doctor. James 1 verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, what's it say next? Let him ask of God. And the word ask there is a present imperative. It has a sense of continual request. We could perhaps paraphrase the verse, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him be always asking of God. We're to wait on the Lord. It may be that our prayers at first do not seem to be being heard or answered. Do we give up? No. If, we, if we're going to gain that spiritual resilience that we spoke of last week and, and perseverance, then we should be always asking in prayer. And it's as we do that, it's so often that we, we experience the Lord's presence in a more meaningful way. And we know his comfort. Let's, let's be wary of that dash-in, dash-out approach in our prayer lives. We, we come to the storerooms of God's wisdom and grace, and we wait upon him for his resources. And this ability to ask will be kept alive if we seek humility in our lives. If we have that right perspective of God's greatness and our inadequacy, or if we have a greater knowledge of our own spiritual poverty compared to the riches in Christ, then we will see our need and run to the giver in prayer more frequently and more earnestly. It was said of Robert Murray McChain that he dwelt at the mercy seat like he was at home. I wonder, could that be said of us tonight? Scripture is full of characters who have known the blessing of spiritual wisdom from God. Uh, but ordinarily, as we read the accounts, we see that it is requested first of the Lord. Solomon prayed to God, Now give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people, for who can judge this great people of yours? Daniel thanked God, didn't he? Uh, you have given me wisdom and might, and you have made, now made known to me what we asked of you. Paul prayed for the Ephesian church, Ephesians 1.17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom. We see then that we are to ask. But ask who? It says there we are to ask of God. And that's important. As believers, we can all approach God in prayer through the Lord Jesus, who is our great high priest. We need no human intermediary, such as a priest or even a pastor. We can make direct request of God ourselves. What a tremendous blessing and privilege that is. We need no saint or Mary to plead on our behalf. We certainly shouldn't be consulting ourselves, as the world might suggest. And we should be wary of the world's psychological advice and counsel. Spiritual wisdom will not be found from those sources, so we should not look for it there. Having said that, there are benefits to sharing burdens with each other so that we can more effectively pray for each other. James goes on to say that elsewhere in his letter. But this wisdom that we're talking of here can only be made, uh, the request can only be made personally of God. So when we come to the Lord praying for wisdom, we are to come in faith. 
That's what we read there next. What does that actually mean? We read in Hebrews 11.6 how essential faith is whenever we come to God. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We must come to the Lord then with a deep-rooted belief and faith in who God is and what he has done for us. A faith and a belief in, the knowledge, in, in God's knowledge of us and our circumstances and his ability to answer our prayers. We come knowing that he personally cares for us and he is able to give us the wisdom that we need to endure our trials with joy. Our faith and our confidence is in Christ who prays on our behalf. It's because of that we can come, as we read Hebrews 4.16, we can come boldly or confidently to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We read similarly elsewhere, 1 John 5 verse 14, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. This prayer is one we can pray in confidence because scripture commands us to. We can know 100% for sure that we are praying in accordance with the will of God when we pray what God's word tells us to. We might call it God's general will. We may know, not know what his exact will is, but when we pray from scripture, prayers such as for the conversion of the lost or for freedom from sin, for Christ to build his church, or as we have here, for, for spiritual wisdom, we have scriptural backing for that. We are praying for God's revealed will to be done so we can come with confidence. And as we do so, thirdly then, we see a full provision. We see there in verse 5, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to you all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Again, we see the present tense, God gives. It's an ongoing and a limitless supply. John Blanchard, in his, in his commentary on James, aptly puts it. He, he says, It is characteristic of the unbeliever to see God with a clenched fist. It's characteristic of the believer to see him with an open hand. God gives liberally and generously. When we view the nature of God as a generous giver, surely we are all the more encouraged to come boldly to him with our requests. So that begs the question of us then, does, doesn't it? How giving is God in our minds? And how boldly do we come to him? It's interesting to see that the word for liberal, or he gives liberally in the Greek, is haplos, which we could literally translate with singleness of heart. That's interesting because it stands in contrast to the double-hearted man that we read of in verse 8, James Moody writes, God gives with a single motive, to further the welfare of the asker. He gives without ulterior motives, harboring no calculated desire to get something in return. He gives to all wholeheartedly and with singleness of purpose. And he also gives with a wealth of liberality. Close quote. He, we see next in verse 5 there, that God gives to all without exception, although this is obviously speaking within the context of believers. God is not partial to a favorite few, but is generous to all who ask him in faith. We read uh, a little further on in the chapter in verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. The Father's good gifts to his children, of which wisdom is one, comes down to us freely, 
plentifully and with no return clauses. Praise God for his full provision for us in our times of need. And uh, James finishes in that verse by saying that this provision is given without reproach. The word again is another present tense or or ongoing word. God never gives with reproach. The word reproach here means disgrace or to insult, to upbraid, to, to slander, to falsely accuse, to mock. God never gives in this way. Hybert says, God does not respond to our petition and then heap insults upon us for asking. He doesn't offensively recall the benefits already given or rebuke the applicant who asks for more. He doesn't give in a way that humiliates the receiver. He doesn't scold because we have inadequately used his former gifts or rebuke us for our repeated lack of wisdom. God's generosity is measured by what he designs and not by what we deserve. What a blessing that is. The gentleness and compassion in those words without reproach. These words should convict us as the Lord's people of our unwillingness to seek wisdom in times of trial. When we seek to to lean on our own understanding rather than seeking wisdom from above. Our Father in heaven is generous and giving and kind in all his dealings with us. It's important, as a side note, to remember too, though, that God doesn't condone our sin or treat it lightly. He does rebuke us for our failure to trust him. And he will cause us to depend more fully on him, even by putting us through these these trials and times of testing that we're talking of. Well, finally, this evening, we've seen that we have this familiar need of wisdom. We've seen that we should faithfully respond in prayer for wisdom. And we see that if we do so, that there is that full provision. But lastly, we must take heed to the warnings that we read of in verses 7 to 8. And here we look at the faithless decline. The flip side of having a confident faith is that we doubt. Let's let's be clear, it is possible to have weak faith and all the more possible in times of particular hard testing. And we might ask, well, what if my faith is weak? Will God not answer? It's encouraging to remember that the Christian life is not necessarily about strong faith, but it's about a strong saviour. We looked recently with Jason on a Sunday morning at Mark 9 of the father who cried out, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. How, how we can relate to that at times. But we can build our faith. It is through knowing God better. And how we do that, how do we do that? It's by reading his word. We read in Romans 10 verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We need to be in the word. We need to know the Lord better. And as as that happens, our faith will increase in the one who we know more of. James describes the one who doubts like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. A wave is unstable. We read that in verse 8. A wave is chaotic, it's out of control and influenced by the wind which is external to itself. This is such a good description of one who lacks faith. The believer is buffeted throughout his life by many different winds, if we look at it in that way. Whether that's the wind of unsound doctrine and teaching in the church, it could be the wind of hard and unusual circumstances, It could be the wind of persecution in all its many forms. It could be the wind of ill health or terminal illness. It could be the wind of bereavement. Just to name a few, there are many winds that buffet us as believers. But do we respond like a wave, 
Are we chaotic and tossed about? Or will we respond like a lighthouse, grounded on Christ, firm and shining bright in a dark world? If, if we doubt God's existence or his ability to give us wisdom for our need, then we are double-minded. It's madness to ask something of someone who we don't believe can actually give it to us. It's even more mad to ask someone who we don't believe is even there. The mind of one is, of such a person is split in two, hence being called double-minded. The meaning of this word in the original language is literally double-heartedness, the opposite of being whole-hearted or single-minded, as we saw of God. It, it points to the inward battle, doesn't it, between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, which we studied in Galatians 5. It's when a person is, is pulled in two directions. When we are tried, our flesh wars against the Spirit. Self-pity wars against the instruction of the Lord and obedience to Him. And at such times, we come in faith, yes, maybe weakly, but we come knowing God is there and He is our only hope. And through this lack of faith and doubts, sorry, though this lack of faith and doubts can sometimes be present in all of us, as we thought, uh, as we said earlier, with that, that father who cried, help my unbelief, we should never be content with doubt. We should never be content with weak faith. And we should seek to root it out with the help of the Holy Spirit, those doubts within us. When we feel like we just don't know what to do, we turn to the one who does. And we pray to God who made all, knows all, and can do all things. It's to the faithful that Christ makes the startling promise, isn't it? Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. That's not to say that God is a genie in a bottle or a dispensing machine into which we insert a prayer and out comes the selection. But the promise of answered prayer makes its spiritual demands upon us that we must ask in faith. We see briefly that there are three characteristics of the faithless. Uh, and in their request for wisdom, the, 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 the doubting and the faithless man or woman are firstly unsuccessful, they're uncertain, and they're unsteady. After the description of the one who doesn't ask in faith in verse 6, we see that they are unsuccessful. Let not that man suppose to receive anything from the Lord. Whilst he may pray without faith, they should not expect a positive response. In times of trial, we, we often can feel uncertain about God and feel isolated from him. Just like John Bunyan's Christian there in Doubting Castle when captured by giant despair. We begin to listen to the voices in our heads that say, you're on your own in this. Does God really care for me? What good can possibly come from this? Why is this happening to me? We too soon forget that God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. We're not alone in, the, in these struggles. Think of those in the Bible who spiritually uh, wobbled, you might say. Think of Elijah, and he said, It's enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I'm not better than my father's. Or Jeremiah facing being beaten and put in the stocks, cries out, Oh Lord, you deceived me. What about John the Baptist there in prison? Sends a message to Jesus asking, Are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? How about us? How's our faith? Do we doubt the Lord's ability to work all things for our good? Which nature is winning the spiritual battle in the trials we face? The faithless and doubting one should not suppose that God will give him anything. So let's come then in full assurance of faith and seek wisdom from our Father in heaven. So the doubting one is unsuccessful, but secondly, they're uncertain. We see that in, in verse 8 with the word double-minded, as we said earlier. 
If we doubt and lack faith, we find ourselves in an uncertain state of mind, torn in the two directions between God's ways and our ways. We're talking here of the one who is uncertain about the truth of something, uncertain of the sovereignty of God. This state of mind leads to erratic behavior and indecision and fear. Just like the rabbit in the headlights of an oncoming car doesn't know which way to run, dashing to the left and to the right and back to the left again and eventually probably run over. This behavior is not what we should be like as believers. At its very worst, it's seen in the unbelieving hypocrite, isn't it, who lacks integrity, claiming one thing and living another. As, as we study through the book of James, we'll come across frequently this concept of being divided or having a divided heart, being double-minded. Are we those whose minds are tossed to and fro with various ideas? From one moment being lifted up on a wave of presumption and then cast down in the valley of despair? Are we torn between hope and fear concerning our acceptance with God? If, if when we examine ourselves we see symptoms of being double-minded, we must ask the Lord to rid us of it. Just like the psalmist did in 86, Psalm 86, 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. I will walk in thy truth. Unite my heart to fear thy name. In other words, Lord, give me a oneness of mind and a oneness of heart. Lord, give me faith. Lord, remove my doubts. Help me to rest in your sovereignty. Help me to trust in you and you alone. Unite my heart so that it's not divided, that it's a single heart. So the doubting one is unsuccessful, uncertain, but they're unsteady. We see that in verse 8. He is unstable in all his ways, or literally staggering, reeling like a drunkard. Why is the doubter unstable? Because they lack a sure foundation and as such are wobbly and unstable, constantly changing their minds. Manton writes that an unstable man has no constancy of soul. He is sometimes ready to depart from God and sometimes to be close to him. He is not settled in his religious profession. We see in verse 8 then that this instability exists in all his ways. It's not just one area of life. This lack of faith affects, no, it affects everything. Being double-minded, we cannot decide what we believe. If, we, if, we, if we're in that situation, if we don't know what to believe, how will we know how to live? We can so easily get caught up in every wind of change that blows through our lives and through society. If we have no deep-rooted convictions grounded in God's word, then we will constantly find our hearts captured and worried. Uh, our hearts captured by and worried by every little uncertainty that comes our way. So, as we wrap up, I hope we can now answer that question we posed at the start of our study, what to do when we don't know what to do. Every believer will face those times in our lives when we feel that familiar need of a lack of wisdom, when we just don't know what to do. It's in these times that we should show that faithful response of bringing our need to God in prayer. In faith, praying that, we should, that he would shed his wisdom into the situation. We are to display that singleness of heart and mind in our sovereign God, putting aside all doubting, and trust in anything other than him. When we are going through these times of hardship, there's nothing wrong in saying, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? Lord, is, is there a lesson to be learned here? Because if there is, then I want to learn it. If, if this circumstance is going to go on for a while, and there is nothing I can do to change it, then, then give me the daily grace I need to bear it. But if there's something I need to learn, then cause me to grow. Tell me how I can change, Lord. If we come in humility with that spirit of faith, then we will know God's full provision.
from his willing and generous, ha generous hand. We note too that uh, the, the warnings of scripture concerning the faithless being declined and we see how a divided heart will bring uncertainty and instability in our lives. When trials come, when temptations and tests are brought into our lives, let's remember that although we may not have all the answers, we do know the one who does. And we cast ourselves on to the Lord, just as the psalmist did when he asked, Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. Yes, there may be times when we don't know what to do, but we know the one who does. And in faith we pray for his wisdom, knowing he is not only able, but will freely and wonderfully provide for us as we come to him.